Hello everyone, welcome to this session of SWATCOP tutorials. Here I'm going to talk about the all important objective function issues. Uh, but before I go on, I would like to refresh your memory on two factors that we use to assess the goodness of fit in SWATCOP. One of them is P factor, which represents model accuracy. P factor is the percentage of data bracketed by the 95% prediction uncertainty and it is a measure of model accuracy. The larger the p-factor, the higher model prediction accuracy. And by p-factor, we are talking about all the points that fall within the 95% PPU here. Those are the measures or the observations which have been uh, simulated well by our model. And then there are points which are outside the 95 PPU, and that would be uh, is described as one minus p factor, which would be a measure of model error. So the points that do not fall within 95 PPU are the points which have not been simulated by our model. The other factor is uh, R factor, which represents model uncertainty. R factor is the average thickness of the 95 PPU divided by the standard deviation of the observation and it is a measure of model uncertainty. The larger the R factor, the higher model prediction uncertainty. And you can see more about these two factors in uh, SWAT Cup tricks number four. Now having said that, um, usually when I give my presentations, I talk about different issues with respect to calibration of distributed watershed models. And I think these are issues that need more research and more work. These include parameterization, objective function definition, optimization algorithm, non-uniqueness, parameter conditionality, and so on. Now, with respect to objective function, which is the topic of our talk today, I always say this is the most surprising aspect of calibration. And that is because once you have calibrated your model using a certain objective function, you realize that if you had used a different objective functions, you would have gotten a different range of parameters, a significantly different range of parameters. Now, objective function is usually defined as the function that we use to optimize to obtain our model parameters. There are 11 types of such functions in, in uh, SWATCOP, and most of them, or all of them really, are designed to minimize the difference between an observation and a, and, and a simulated variable. There are five different types of objective functions that I would like to discuss with you here. And these include single objective functions, single objective functions which are behavioral, multiple objective functions, and multiple objective functions which are behavioral, and then a constrained objective function. Now all of these objective functions could be applied to a single variable such as discharge or to a multiple number of variables such as discharge, sediment, nitrate, and so on. Now let me go through this one by one. Single objective functions is something you are all familiar with. Here you use a certain performance criteria such as nice Sutcliffe. Uh, with that equation, and then you formulate your objective function. For a single objective, single variable, you use nice Sutcliffe, for example, for discharge. Or you could have single objective for multiple variables, where you average different variables, for example, for discharge and for sediment here, you average their single objective functions and to get the uh, objective function for multiple vari variables. For a single objective function, behavioral, you do what you had before with the difference that you put a certain threshold on the acceptable value of nice Sutcliffe for every simulation. So you accept the simulations only if the single objective, single variable value is larger than 0 0.7. That means here no, nice Sutcliffe is 0 point, larger than 0 0.7. Or if you have multiple variable, the same thing. The average nice salt cliff is more than 0 0.6 or any other threshold value. Number three is multiple objective function. With multiple objective function, you can use the different uh, objective functions that we have, the, the performance criteria that we have, 
to build a multiple objective function. Or you can use a number of them. Some of these objective functions can produce the same values. So you can use, for example, R squared, nice or three for P wise, or any other combination of these that you would like, and give a weight to each one. And the weights are given in such a way that they, they, they ensure that they each have uh, equal contribution to the overall objective function. Now, you can apply the same thing to a multiple variable and just average the multi-objective for different variables. Number four is multiple objective function for behavioral case. And this is again the same as previous one plus the fact that we put a threshold of acceptance on the value of the multi-objective, either single variable or multivariable. Finally, we have the constraint objective function. Now, our various objective functions, we have single objective, single objective behavior, multiple objective, and multiple objective behavior. You can put a further constraint on these, these functions, and you say that you, are, you accept a simulation only if the annual soil loss is larger than 200 tons, 200 tons per hectare, for example, or annual evapotranspiration is less than 300 millimeter, or nitrate is greater than 100 tons per hectare, or total phosphorus from agricultural land is larger than 50 tons per hectare, and etc. and etc. You could formulate hundreds of such constraints if you have the information. Now, where does the information come from? These we refer to as soft data. And soft data are data that come from expert information. Usually expert has, they, they have a lot of information which is not written down anywhere or there is no formal report about them. If you talk to them, they can tell you that, the, for example, the soil erosion in this watershed is larger than 200 tons per hectare or 1,000 tons per hectare and so on. So this is the information that they have based on their experience and years of working in a watershed. There is also information in the literature, and somebody has done a limited work number, uh, for a number of months or years on a, on a region and has written a PhD report or something that you have can glean some information. There is based on limited measured data that might be available or annually measured data or whatever credible information that you can get from a watershed can serve as a soft data and it can limit your model simulations. If you can limit the number of simulations, you will decrease your uncertainty, your prediction uncertainty. Now, where are these programs? These programs, we have different versions of SWAT Cup. Uh, SWATCOP 2019 has a single objective only and for one or multiple variables. SWATCOP Premium has single objective and multiple ob objective. And for the constraint objective, uh, currently we are adding that to, to this program. SWATCOP Plus that was recently released has single objective for one or many variables. And SWATCOP Plus Premium which is under development, will have all of these options and hopefully it will be coming soon. Now, why should we use multiple objective functions? We use multiple objective functions because if you use a single objective functions and if you use different single objective functions, you will get different uh, set of calibrated uh, parameter ranges, as I said before. Now, to give you an example, look at this example here, based on the paper uh, shown below. If you use different, here we used eight different objective functions, and we calibrated each one using a different objective functions. And then we plotted the water yield millimeter per year for the whole watershed. You see the difference. There is a significant difference when you use different objective functions in the value of the uh, water yield. So which one of these is correct? I mean, we don't know. If you, for example, plot soil moisture, again, you see a very different, uh, very different information you can get from your, your calibrated model. So this is because parameters are conditioned on the objective function that you use. So if you're using 
a single objective function that leads to conditional set of calibrated parameters which is conditioned on that objective functions this is true for everything else when you use something that you could have used something else so if you have 10 different land uses and you use one of those land uses to build and calibrate your model then if you had used another land use you would have come up with a totally different um, parameters that is clear same thing here your calibrated parameters get conditioned on the objective function that you are using so how do we solve this we need to get unconditional parameters always with respect to everything so to get unconditional parameters with respect to objective function you need to integrate over different objective functions so that's why multiple objective functions were introduced so here is another example of why we should uh, formulate a multi-objective function if I use single objective for R squared, nice subgroup, and P bias, and then I have uh, calibrated my model based on these different objective functions, and here I have P factor, R factor, and then R squared, nice subgroup, and P bias. So here you note that if I use R squared as my objective function, I get a very good R squared for my uh, model prediction. In fact, the best R squared of, of these three. If I use nice Sutcliffe, I get the best nice Sutcliffe of these three. If I use P bias, I get the best P bias. So you see that my results for a single objective function is conditioned on that objective function value, right? And then if you, these are relatively all good simulation results. Now, if I look at my parameters, this is where the problem comes in. If I look at my parameters, my parameter ranges and the best parameter set, you see they are substantially and significantly different from each other. That's why if I use now my calibrated model based on any of these, and I do consequent analysis with that model, I'm going to have very different values. So here, that's the surprising <laughs> issue. So which one of these should I should I use? Now, let me give you some more example uh, which i did uh, run a model and summarize the examples here so if i use single objective i use nice Sutcliffe, and i'm calibrating this charge so i get a p factor of 0 0.76 which is quite good if you have more than 70 percent of your discharge in the 95 ppu uh, curve then this is really this is quite acceptable so my error here would be 1 minus that, which is 24%. Then I have an R factor of 1.1, which is sort of acceptable if it is around 1. Then R squared, nice South Cliff, and P bias for uh, the best parameters. Now, if I put a threshold on that uh, objective functions, and I say only nice South Cliff of 0, uh, better than 0 0.7 is acceptable then you can see that clearly my R factor is going to decrease. That means my model uncertainty is going to substantially decrease. But then the problem is that my P factor is also decreasing. My model accuracy is also decreasing because the thickness of the 95 PPU, as we discussed before, also gets narrower. Now, the R squared, nice subcliff and P bias are, are unchanged. Now, if I use a multi-objective, using R squared, nice subgroup, and P bias, as I showed before. Then you see that I have the same sort of P factor. I have the same R factor as, as the single objective. But the big change is here in my P bias. Now that I included P bias in my objective function, I get a significant reduction in P bias. Now if I put a threshold on that, so if I put a threshold of 0 0.8, on the value of objective functions, then what happens here is that I get a substantial reduction on my R factor, that's my uncertainty, but I more or less have the same P factor, the same model, accu model accuracy. So this is what we want. We would like to have a smaller model uncertainty with more or less the same or better model accuracy, right? So in this case, also my P bias decreases um, substantially uh, because I have included it in my objective function. Now I made another run and I put another 
constraint on the single objective function case, on this case only. So I can compare this line with the first line. When I put the constraint of sediment larger than 200 tons per hectare, what I get is my model uncertainty decreases substantially. This is a very good news that my uncertainty is lower. But another good news is that my p factor did not decrease as much as if I had put a, thresh a behavioral threshold. So my p factor goes from 76 to 66, so it's still quite high, but my uncertainty is quite a bit lower. And also my p bias has decreased quite a bit, while the R squared and Nash star cliff are more or less stayed the same. So this was a very good choice. Now you have to remember that this constraint is different from the behavioral constraint. Behavioral constraint is on the objective function. Whereas constraint is this constraint here uh, is on a variable. So you can constrain a variable. Here I'm not calibrating on sediment. That's important to notice that I am not calibrating on sediment. I only have discharge data. But I have some measure of sediment from the watershed that I can use to reduce the number of acceptable simulations. Now if I show you all the simulation of sediment results, you will see that they are range, they have a big range of differences. So I here I did about 1000 or so simulations. And here you see that the sediment, annual sediment discharge from my watershed can range from 28 tons per hectare to, I don't know, some very large values I saw, so to 1922 tons per hectare. So the constraint that I put was that they should be larger than 200. Only those were accepted, and that made the substantial difference in my model simulation. And this model is much more, uh, there is much more, they can be much more confident on this model, and it's a much better model than, for example, this model. Because not only I calibrated for, uh, for discharge, and I have very good discharge uh, results, I have quite an acceptable sediment result based on the soft data that I could uh, obtain. Now, finally, I have some recommendations to finish this video. And my recommendations are that don't just be a model user, please. Always investigate the issues. We have a lot of things to investigate scientifically, and there are a lot of things we don't know. So be critical of the models that you, you are using and try to make them better. Don't just be a model user. And also deepen your analysis when you write papers. Make more analysis. Change objective functions. Change this or that or that. You can do a lot of things. If you look at our videos and the papers, uh, you will find a lot of things that you can do for in your project to deepen your analysis. And this will help everyone scientifically. It will also help you to publish your paper uh, in a better journal and uh, get acceptable results. And finally, always try to come up with new ideas. Don't just use the same ideas over and over again. Uh, we need a lot of new methods and a lot of new ideas uh, from the younger people who are coming into uh, the education system, going through the system. So think about what you're doing and try to come up with something better. So thank you for watching and please uh, remember to subscribe and also so that we can produce more, vi uh, more videos. And also if you like to see something, uh, please write your comments to Swakop Google Group. That would be the best place for communication. If you have recommendations or you have new ideas, please write it. And if you want things included in the model and so on, I can probably accommodate for that. Thank you.